you very much, uh, Christine, for the introduction, and thanks a lot to the organizers uh, for the kind invitation. And uh, I apologize also for those uh, who heard uh, my talk in Grenoble last year because I will be reporting on the same research project. So if feel free to sleep until slide 17, then mm. I will uh, wake you up again. So today I, I'm going to report about a research project uh, I've done in collaboration uh, with Alessio Marta, a PhD student of mine, uh, well, former PhD student because the defendant a few months ago at the University of Milan, and the talk will be mostly based on this paper. I, I, I ask for your indulgence one second again because my students in Pavia, they told me they will listen to this talk remotely, and they told me that I will never behave like a proper Italian who says hello at home because I always feel ashamed of that, so I told them that from here I will tell all of my students in Pavia, hi. <laughs> so I just, I'll, I name them Alberto, Beatrice, Giovanni, and Luca. So if you're listening to this talk, you are acknowledged. So now that I stop behaving like an Italian and go back switching to my Swiss side, <laughs> I, I was born in Switzerland. So this is my Swiss side, let's uh, be serious. So first of all, I will give you some motivations then focus on the geometric analytic data. Uh, these, these data are probably for most of you well known, but I never know if in the audience there's no one, let's say, familiar with basic, uh, let's say, basic uh, stuff like B calculus. Nowadays, basic stuff like B calculus. So I decided to put some background information. And in the third and fourth part, I will um, delve into the main results, most notably. Uh, propagation of singularity theorem and the construction of fundamental solution and other mouth states uh, in the case in hand. So, uh, well, some motivation, as, uh, as you might have noticed from the title page, uh, I am uh, one, the last of a kind, uh, namely, I'm really, honestly, seriously, the last uh, official mathematical physicist who has been hired in Italy in a, in a physics department. So, uh, I need always to give motivations uh, coming from physics. Uh, since I need to justify why I'm there. And uh, no, most notably, nowadays, well, my background education is in quantum field theory and curved space times. And uh, we, we all know, we have heard about the talk of, of Bob and of Kaja. And uh, we know nowadays that quantum field theory on curved space time is a very developed, well developed. Uh, let's say, framework, I would say quite on par with quantum field theory on Minkowski spacetimes, provided that the underlying background is a global hyperbolic. Nonetheless, uh, most of you are certainly familiar with the fact that out there, there are several models, uh, even in relativistic physics, but also, say, from condensed matter physics, where the underlying background is by all means not a global hyperbolic spacetime. Well, I could mention uh, trying to discuss, uh, for example, effects like the Casimir effect, but probably if you're coming from relativistic uh, quantum field theory, you're certainly well aware of ADS spacetimes, which are definitely not globally hyperbolic spacetimes because they do possess a conformal time-like boundary. And as far as, let's say, quant the algebraic formulation of quantum field theory is concerned, I cannot claim that this is uh, really so well understood. A lot has been understood in the past years, but not a lot, uh, not everything for sure. For example, one thing that I realized at least, uh, let's say now it's around six or seven years ago, is that in most of the physics literature, even for good reasons in many cases, but when you're discussing fields, uh, let's say quantum fields on space time with a time-like boundary, you're always uh, at least either implicitly or explicitly assuming that the underlying boundary condition is Dirichlet, sometimes for convenience, sometimes because there are physical reasons. But in many cases, if you want to define a full-fledged quantum field theory, uh, you realize that there is no real reason why you should be doing that. You have a plethora of additional options and choices, and you might ask yourself, well, why not? What's go is something going wrong? Can I really define a quantum field theory with these boundary conditions? Furthermore, in the past few years, uh, uh, we have, uh, let's say, in the literature, especially in the theoretical physics literature, you have seen, uh, let's say, discussing uh, novel phenomena, of course, and some old phenomena like super radiance, of course, we have heard about it uh, in previous talks, but other phenomena, 
mostly due to the community coming from quantum information, like the anti-hocking effect, or what they call entanglement, harvest, entanglement harvesting, and often for simplicity of the models, they are discussing these phenomena on manifolds, which are not global hyperbolic, but actually do possess a time-like boundary. And in all these cases, the question, what is the interplay between these phenomena and the choice of boundary conditions is certainly, I won't say of paramount relevance, but certainly a good and open question. And of course, I'm also interested in, in the mathematical formulation of quantum field theory on space times with boundaries. Well, historically, I've been mostly interested uh, on quantum field theories uh, when uh, the underlying background possesses a null boundary, but also time-like boundary is a very important and relevant question. Well, of course, uh, many authors have paved the way. I do apologize if I've forgotten uh, someone in this audience. So this is, uh, of course, unintentional, but let me say that for the sake of this talk, uh, I've much uh, enjoyed the, the work of, of Gano and Brockner, which is here listed. So well, let's try to go step by step. The first step is fixing the geometry. So I will be considering a, a space time uh, of some manifold M with a metric head G, and I will be requiring that the boundary of this manifold is a smooth Lorentzian manifold. And of course, one can say, well, what, what do you mean by global hyperbolic? Okay, let me advertise the recent work, uh, well, three years old by now, by Ake Flores and Sanchez, uh, who have uh, basically extended the notion of global hyperbolic spacetime we are all familiar with to manifolds uh, with a time like boundary. So, when I'm referring to global hyperbolic spacetime with a time like boundary, I'm referring to this definition. I will not uh, dwell into the details, but suffice to say that the more, well, I, I will, at least for me, one of the most important consequences of the definition of global hyperbolic global hyperbolicity is that you can rewrite the metric in the following form after isometries, and this holds true also in this extended definition. So a global hyperbolic spacetime will be uh, isometric to R cross sigma with the boundary of sigma non-trivial, and the metric will be in the following form. Now, I will also need uh, to discuss asymptotical ADS space times. Uh, you might be asking, I anticipate one of the questions, whether I'm interested in the ADS CFT correspondence, because that's the first thing you think when uh, you read the word ADS, and the answer is absolutely not. Never, ever. So, uh, if you're, is this relevant for ADS CFT? The answer is no. Uh, well, but there is a physical reason for that. The main point of the ADS CFT, at least in the original correspondence, is that in these interacting theories, the infrared and the ultraviolet uh, sector in the boundary, at the boundary and in the bulk are interchanged. And this is not going to happen in the models I'm considering or I've considered in my, in my research. Nonetheless, as in topical ADS space time are quite relevant for many other reasons. And here I will be calling an asymptotical ADS space time if, you, if there exists a boundary function such that the bulk space time admits a Lorentzian metric, the boundary corresponds to the locus x equals zero, and up to a conformal rescaling by x squared, you get a metric g hat, which extends to a smooth Lorentzian metric, or this will be on m, of course. And also the boundary has a smooth Lorentzian metric, and you have a normalization constant. So I will be considering henceforth global hyperbolic space times, which are also asymptotically ADS. Uh, well, a disclaimer, if you are coming from the GR community, this definition of asymptotically ADS is not the one you would probably use. It's a kind of different notion, I would say, manifolds which resemble to uh, ADS asymptotically, but so it's different from the, say, for example, definition by Ashtekar and Das in this paper, of course, ADS is included in this class, but let's say that uh, this is the definition which is mostly used in, uh, by me and in this community, so I will not use the GR, uh, GR notion. If you, don't want, if you don't want to call it asymptotic ADS, uh, that's perfectly fine. If you want to have in mind an example, think of ADS spacetime in the Poincaré patch. So they take the universal cover and the Poincaré patch of ADS spacetime, this fits perfectly fine, and to be honest, that was my starting example when uh, analyzing these, these problems. And not at all, so the metric, uh, to be exactly so, 
to be this matrix needs not to be Einstein. So that's exactly the, the difference. And no condition even on, on the chaos stress energy test. So that's why I'm saying uh, we also discussed this is not really as entropical ADS as I would normally call it. Okay, in addition, uh, for technical reasons, uh, we will be assuming that uh, the manifold is a manifold, is a lantern manifold of bounded geometry. This is tantamount to saying that uh, M can be endowed with a Riemannian manifold such that this is of bounded geometry and there are suitable conditions on the Lorentz and metric which are not particularly relevant. For this reason, herein you can introduce the standard Sobolev spaces, HK of M, just to fix the notation. Okay, so, so far so good. That was all for as far as the geometry is concerned. Let's instead look a, li a little bit at uh, more the analytic data we'll be needing. Just uh, if you pay attention until I get to slide 17, it will be mostly background information. From slide 17 onwards, I will be discussing the results. So here I need the tangent, the B, or some information of B calculus. If you're not familiar with it, for example, you will be starting from the B tangent space, uh, which is nothing but your usual tangent space at the point P in the bulk, whereas at the boundary, this is the span of these vector fields. On top of it, which will, you will be needing, the, needing, you get a greater differential uh, algebra generated by the sections of uh, the B tangent bundles, uh, which is graded as we usually know. And on top of it, we have properly, I will be considering properly supported the pseudo differential operator, which are, will be denoted by this symbol. Okay. So if you think of the Poincare patch, uh, of ADS, uh, which is very instructive, and you try to solve, say, the klein gordon equation on the, in the Poincaré page of ADS, uh, since uh, there, is, uh, there are a lot of symmetries, you can easily reduce it to a sturm liouville problem along the direction orthogonal to the, to the time-like boundary. And it's very instructive because uh, this, this is very easy to solve in terms of Bessel functions, and you see exactly when you have a klein gordon field in the Poincaré patch, how it behaves close to the boundary. And you see that if you take the solutions, these solutions of the klein gordon equation behave at a certain power of this coordinate z, which is nothing but x in my framework, as x to a certain index, which I here call nu minus, and a certain index a nu plus, so one which is clearly more divergent than the other. This is the reason why in all, these, uh, in all these models, you often want to introduce these symbols, which basically are telling you how the solution of your klein gordon equation is behaving towards the time-like boundary. And here I will be using this uh, new plus minus, uh, which are defined as follows. If you're familiar with the ADS uh, literature, then you notice this square root, and I will be requiring that the square root is strictly positive or equal to zero, which is nothing but the brighton loden friedman bound in this setting. Now, on top of it, what's, uh, I need twisted differential operators, okay? One might ask, uh, why? Well, I'm thinking always in terms, I have to explain it to say, uh, a physics students, I know that if you are working in microlocal analysis, or this, it might be totally obvious that you need to twist it, but if you want to explain it to someone who's not familiar with it, you might tell him, look, if you try to look at your fields uh, close to the boundary and you say, and you look at the most singular part of your solution, this goes as x to the new minus. So you remove the singularity, you apply your differential operator, and then you reinstate your, your singular behavior. And that's exactly with this, what, let's say, roughly speaking, this twisted differential operator is doing. Then on top of it, you need, of course, to have twisted Hilbert spaces, because if you twist the derivatives, also your underlying functional space need to know about that. And they need to know about that, and then you do it as follows. First, uh, you introduce this, uh, um, I think it's math called curly L2 space, uh, which is uh, quite reasonable, because it takes into account this conformal factor, no, no surprise. But it is H1 is ex are basically the L2 function such that if you apply a twist uh, uh, like an operator in diff one, this is also in L2. Similar definition you can have when it's compactly supported, H10, H1 lock, and so on and so forth. Okay, now that, uh, there are some fun facts, if you want to call, 
mostly proven by Vajig and Novrock and many other authors, uh, not, nothing uh, at this level particularly surprising, namely if you have uh, a beep pseudo differential operator of order zero, this induces a continuous map between uh, these spaces. Or uh, when you see a dot, uh, it means that this has been constructed as the completion uh, with respect to a suitable norm of the smooth functions uh, which vanish at the boundary together with all their derivatives. That's just to explain new notation. And per duality, they can be extended to, the, to these spaces. Okay, so one asks why? Well, what's the goal here? The goal here is to, at some point I will be considering a klein garden equation. I want to fix a, a general class of boundary conditions. A general class of boundary condition means, means that I need a relation between, as we would say morally, the derivative of the field the normal to the boundary and the field at the boundary itself. Of course, since solutions are not smooth, uh, then you need the trace maps. And the trace maps have to be adapted to, to this particular context. So the reason why I introduce all these spaces is that I want to get to the point that I can formulate a klein garden equation with arbitrary boundary conditions, and I need, therefore, trace maps. And on account of what I told you before, one can prove, thanks to these gentlemen, that there exists a continuous map, which I denote as gamma twiddle minus, from H10 to H ni, ni being the index I've mentioned before, on the boundary of M. Well, if you'd say, um, okay, a little bit abstract, Right, but if you think, for example, uh, the Poincaré patch of, uh, of ADS, and then you look, your manifold is nothing but R to the N minus one cross zero infinity, then you can, uh, close to the boundary, you see that, for example, a function which lies in this space can be expanded in the following form, and what the, your trace map is doing is basically reading this U minus, which is the coefficient in front of the most singular term. So that's exactly what something you want to have. Okay, so now functional spaces, uh, I'm sure you, you want more of them. I also know people who don't like chocolate, so I guess there are people who don't like functional spaces, <laughs> although I'm, I, I accept it and don't understand it, but I do accept it. <laughs> like with chocolate, I, it's, I have a student uh, who doesn't like chocolate, but well. What can I do? You accept him for what he is. And so in this case, uh, or the, the additional functional space uh, you will be needed is this HK, K prime, possibly lock. So basically you have uh, elements in this HK of M such that whenever you apply a beep pseudo differential operator for the K prime, this is still lies in the same HK. In principle, you can, well, you will be needing HK infinity, and this is the intersection between all these spaces. Okay, then uh, last space is if you introduce the klein garden operator in your space, you need the following fresh space, uh, where the, the semi-norms semi are defined in the following way. Okay, then I'm done with functional spaces, I guess, let me see. Okay, then I need one last datum because at some point I need to formulate the klein garden equation and I want to formulate it in a weak form. So I need some energy dense, uh, some energy form. I need an energy form which knows on top of it that I have this potential singular behavior of the solution at the boundary. So this, I needed to do a twisting as I've introduced before. So the reason, for this, uh, well, for, for this reason, you're led to considering uh, some admissible twisting function, which has functions such that up to this scale factor x to the new minus, which makes sense if you think as of, about what I told you before, it's a smooth function. So f lies in this clause. In addition, we require that basically at, this is a positive quantity, and uh, we define this S of F, which is F minus one, Klein-Gordon operator applied to F, which up to this scale, uh, this factor X squared, it's a bounded function. Then you can define a twisted differential, uh, which is defined as follows, and uh, thanks to these data, you have your first ingredient, which is the energy density, the energy form, which is a twisted Dirichlet energy form, because here 
you have your twisted differential and not just the ordinary the run differential. So in, for this reason, this is twisted. Good? Well, but we know that in order to have a, define a full-fledged boundary condition, we need the two trace maps. One we have from before, this was gamma twiddle minus, and now I introduced you energy forms because I need a second, a second uh, let's say, trace map. The second trace map, gamma twiddle plus, is defined from this fresh space in this H1 infinity lock, and it's defined as follows. So here the twisting enters the game, and uh, this is basically the, the formal expression. And why do I believe this is a good idea? Well, first of all, because I trust Michal and Garneau, which is uh, my first reason, and also because when I look at it, I can, def I can deduce a Green's formula. So basically, the following formula holds true, where here, of course, there is this twisting function I've introduced before, but here, gamma twiddle plus enters the game. One can show that the gamma twiddle plus can be extended to a bounded linear map from these spaces, and that the a green formula holds true also when u and v are extended beyond these spaces to these ones. Okay. Now we start with the, the let's say the important part. Now we have all the background material, which is of course probably absolutely either obvious or I, I do understand it's very hard to grasp it at this in a few slides but let's say there is a solid functional geometric background behind it and now let's see at what what is the boundary value problem we are considering I want uh, let's say the strong formulation is that I want h1 lock and then I want uh, my u to fulfill the klein gordon equation and uh, I want it to fulfill a boundary condition which is basically gamma plus is equal to gamma minus u times a pseudo differential of order k. And here, let me stop and say, um, why? Okay, well, of course, among the plethora of boundary condition you want to consider, first and foremost, you would be considering the Robin boundary conditions, which include, of course, Neumann and Dirichlet among them. And of course, this will be tantamount to saying that theta is basically alpha times the identity, possibly alpha being a smooth function at the boundary. This was considered already by Michel and Gano. But when we started working on this topic, we, we realized uh, sooner that you might want to consider other boundary conditions. Probably you have never heard of, of them, but for example, a class of boundary conditions which is used in ADS is called Wenzel boundary conditions, which are dynamical boundary conditions on, on let's say, on the time-like boundary. And therefore, at least from my point of view, it's important to consider the most general class of boundary condition I can work with, because at the end of the day, what is my goal? My goal is give me a klein gordon equation with a boundary condition and tell me first if I can quantize it. What does it mean, quantize it? Quantize it means I can construct an algebra of observables, and on top of it, a state, which is possibly a quasi-free state, constructed out of two-point correlation function, a bi-distribution, with prescribed waveform set and with prescribed anti-symmetric part because a state in quantum field theory is built out of two informations. The first is the singular behavior of the two-point function, which needs to be of Hadamard form, and I will be explaining it later, but also it's very important that the anti-symmetric part allows you to implement the canonical commutation relation in a covariant way, so up to a multiplicative constant. This has to be equal to the advanced minus retarded fundamental solution, of your, uh, of your equation, or if you prefer the Pauli-Jordan commutator function or the causal propagator, depends how you want to call it. But these are the two important data. So if, if I start here classically and I think at a quantum field theory, I need to know whether I can build a state with these two prescribed conditions. But for doing this, at this point, the first question I have to ask myself is, do fundamental solutions exist? Because, well, when I was, uh, uh, let's say, not probably soon after my PhD, I was reading the book written by the book Bergin Pfeffel, which is like, like the first book you, you, at least I learned from uh, that, about Green's operators in a covariant way. And you know that you have them, they're unique, they have all the properties you like, but it's uh, the assumption that the underlying background is globally hyperbolic. 
Now, do I have advanced and retarded fundamental solutions? It's a very basic question, but if I have a general boundary condition, and I ask, I'm telling you, do you know in the literature, nowadays, yes, but let's say 10 years ago, do you know in the literature for a generic boundary condition whether these advanced or retarded fundamental solution exist? Do they possess the same support properties of the counterparts in global hyperbolic space times? It's, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, it, it was not, a, let's say the answer was not complete. Partial answers were known, but not complete answers. Furthermore, if I ask you, well, do I have a, a state which is Hadamard, like Raja or Bob explained in that talk? Well, if you think a little bit to this question, you already realize that the question is very complicated because the very definition of Hadamard states needs to be challenged on account of the fact that there is something we, we all learn, at least, well, any, anyone who has done a little bit of optics learns that when you hit a boundary with a light ray, you expect reflection, which is a very basic fact, which is telling you from the viewpoint of microlocal analysis that in this case, you need to take into account that your singularity propagates along light rays, but when it hits the boundary, at least you expect it to be reflected. And the Hadamard condition in its original formulation does not include this. And that was why I started this project, because when I tried to construct states, for the klein gordon field in asymptotically ADS, in, in ADS spacetime, in the Poincare patch, that's very easy. It's an exercise in Sturm-Liouville theory, if you want. And you have even explicit formula if you have a Neumann-Dirichlet in terms of uh, hypergeometric functions. But then you ask yourself, is this Hadamard? And then you have to think a little bit if you can formulate a new definition. And after you have formulated a new definition, well, at least that's the basic thing you have to ask yourself, do Hadamard state exist? At least not always, but in a general class of, uh, let's say, of space times. And often you would be saying, well, of course, and why? Well, because I, I can construct them in a stationary or static space time, and then I can apply a deformation argument. Yes, but in order to apply a deformation argument, you need the propagation of singularities. So if you even start talking about a, quantum, a free quantum field here in a space-time with a time-like boundary, you realize uh, that I'm not saying you're back to square one, but close to it, because there are many questions which needs to be addressed. And that's a motivation why, when I got to this point, and I, uh, I said, okay, what should we do? And the first thing was, let's try to have a look whether advanced and retarded fundamental solutions exist, do exist, and whether propagation of singularity theorem can be formulated. So, of course, I cannot use a strong formulation. I need a weak formulation, which is the following one. I define uh, energy functional, which is this one, with u and v lying in this space, and I'm looking for u in h1 lock, such that the following relation holds, where p theta is now an operator, my klein gordon operator, which knows about the boundary condition, which goes from h1k to h dot minus 1k lock. Okay. And now I need, and that was also, now I need to, uh, let's say, I need to make precise this fact. I need at least, uh, I need to, a mathematical framework which translates what we learn in optics probably in the second or third semester of, uh, at least for me it was third semester of my studies, a light ray hits the boundary and gets reflected. And to this end, we need uh, something which coming from the calculus, Andra, Schmika, and all people working in this the other I've been introducing, and namely, I need a compressed characteristic set. Namely, we know that what is the characteristic set, say, of the wave operator. Of course, now the compressed characteristic set is basically a projection of n from the cotangent bundle to the B cotangent bundle, which is held like this. Okay, here then I can recognize three distinguished regions a region which is elliptic, a region, a glancing region, and an hyperbolic region. Well, of course, all these three regions will be important. I don't want to dwell too much into the details because, uh, to be honest, I want to skip. I've already given you a lot of details. But suffice to say that when you want to prove uh, propagation singularity theorem, all these regions play a, an important role. What is really important is the notion of a generalized broken B characteristic, which is basically a curve, if it's continuous, from the in interval on the real line into this 
compressed set, which is basically in formulating uh, this fact. So it's basically telling you, look, you have a light rate, it's the boundary, and then it gets reflected. And to descend, you need two conditions, which are here listed. One is this differential condition, where these curly brackets are basically just the Poisson brackets, and p hat is your principal symbol of your operator. And this is a condition on the glancing region, and then there is a condition on the hyperbolic region. These are technical conditions, but like this is, I think it's important rather than understanding them, basically saying, well, I am encoding this fact. And now I need a notion of wave or set which is tailored to the fact that I, that can happen. And uh, to this end, I, we need the notion of uh, B wave from set, and you say that given an element in this space, so where K is either zero plus minus one, whereas M will be allowed to run over the whole uh, real numbers, we say the uh, point in the B cotangent bundles up to the zero section does not lie in the wave from set if you, there is a B pseudo differential operator M such that this point Q lies in the elliptic, in the B elliptic set of A. But basically, it's the set where A is elliptic. Of course, a similar definition can also be given for when this is infinity and here M is finite, but this is not particularly important because the important thing is now that we are at slide the 17. So you can wake up. Now, you smile, pretend that you have paid attention, and now, if you believe what's, what I told you before, we have, uh, we have proven the following two theorems. One, not particularly surprising, basically tells you that if the boundary condition can be implemented from a pseudo-differential operator which is of negative order or order equal to zero, then if you have u which is in H1m with m smaller or equal to zero and s is any real number possible infinity, then the wave from set of u up to p of this up to this bit is the union of maxim maximally extended generalized broken B characteristics within dot n, which is basically the translation in this setting of what you already know about the wave from set, basically it propagates along light rays. And at most in this case, if you were in a global hyperbolic space time, it would be just propagating along light rays. Here, you can also get reflection. The point is if your boundary condition is, might be implemented in terms of a pseudo differential operator of order greater than zero, then you have to pay attention that your theta might add the singularities. So also there is a bit coming out of theta applied to you. So this is basically the difference between these two cases. I have to be fully honest with you. This result is basically, I'm, I'm not even calling a corollary, is basically a rewriting of what uh, Michael and Gano have proven in this paper because they considered Robin boundary conditions, but going to negative orders is, well, makes things better. So of course, you get the same result. So the real point is here. And one uh, now we, that we know that we have a propagation of singularity here, I'm telling you, if your boundary condition is coming from a pseudo differential operator, which is adding singularities, pay attention because not, the, not only this can happen, but something more can happen because theta can add singularities. But if the boundary condition or is not implemented by a pseudo differential operator, which is singular or add singularities, nothing bad happens. Uh, one advertisement, uh, I know that we all like uh, relativistic field theories and I, I've always been criticized because I like a lot uh, uh, stochastic partial differential equations and people are telling me, but these are not relativistic. True, but uh, there's a lot out there, uh, trust me. There are, and for example, uh, one very nice problem you might not be aware, which requires boundary conditions which are not implemented by differential operator, is the melting of icebergs, melting of glaciers. In that case, the boundary, there is, it's a, well, it's a free boundary problem, but at some point you can express in terms of a boundary value problem, and the boundary condition is implemented by a fractional Laplacian. It's the Laplacian to the power one third. For example, Figal is trying to study it, of course, with different methods, but just to telling you that, it's, that boundary conditions uh, with pseudo differential mm -hmm. operators, which are not what we are used to, or the obvious extensions are out there, maybe not in relativistic field theories, 
but there are independent reasons for studying these problems. Nonetheless, I'm back to considering relativistic models, and so henceforth, I will be considering only pseudo-differential uh, operators, theta, which are order smaller or equal than two. They are self-adjoint. They are local in time. It means that you apply theta to you. You cannot spread it in time past the support of you. So nothing bad is happening on account of the boundary condition. And I call it uh, physically admissible or basically not creating a too many problems if basically the wavefront set of theta u is included in the wavefront set of p theta u, which means basically that if you're considering p theta u is equal to zero, this means that you're not adding any singularity. But well, there is a good reason for doing that, because if you want to define the notion of other say, you have to start from the very case where nothing wrong or nothing bad is happening on account of the boundary condition. And that's basically why we are studying this. Of course, it's, uh, it's like a restriction, but you might want to, let's say, consider something more. I'm not doing it here. Okay, I still have uh, 14 minutes here. Okay, so first thing you can prove is existence of solutions. Say, then, let us consider a globally hyperbolic space-time, uh, which is asymptotic ADS in the sense I've told you before. And let us assume that theta abides by the following hypothesis. Then what I can prove is that if I consider a source term which lies in this space and becomes zero in the past, then there exists a unique solution of this problem which lies in H1 m plus k, k being the order of your boundary condition. Well, the, basically, the proof requires that this estimate, this is the key ingredient in the estimate. When you have this estimate, the rest of the proof comes from. Okay, but then, uh, the important thing, you want to now talk about fundamental solutions, and then you want to, uh, let's say, extend the notion of time-like compact functions, or functions which have no restriction on their support in space, but they are compactly supported in time. So you need to extend these, these definitions because we will be needing them. And so we define basically the space of functions which are past compactly supported and future compactly supported, which are this H minus and H plus. And time-like compact are basically those which are both compactly supported in the future and in the past. So basically, if you just want to think to these functions, if you're not familiar with them, that's perfectly fine. It means functions, uh, test functions, which are basically supported only in a string. And then we can also encode the information of the boundary condition. So we will be considering function elements of these spaces, which are either time like compact or past compact, uh, such that the boundary conditions implemented just to realize that this plus and minus have nothing to do with this plus and minus. My bad. It was uh, not good choice of. Uh, of notation, so these are the these are elements of these spaces which are bits by the boundary condition, and that's it. Okay, so what we proved, uh, we proved in, in this paper together with Alessio, is the following. Look, under the previous assumptions, a special assumption on, it, on theta, then you can prove that there exist unique advanced and recorded propagators for P theta, so for the klein gordon operator with prescribed boundary conditions, namely continuous operators from this space to this space, I don't try to read it, which are both left and right inverses, of course, of, of P theta, and they are supported one in the future, the other in the past, as they should, and they can uh, be proven to be continuous map from H dot zero to H one lock, while index infinity as it's listed here. If you notice, I have not written uh, support properties in the causal uh, future in the causal past, not because I don't believe it to be true, but because I'm not able to prove it. So I'm only able to prove that it propagates in the future and propagates in the past. I've tried several ways, energy estimates, uh, methods like in the book of Fritz John. I tried everything, and simply every time there is one additional term which has to go to zero, be positive, I'm not able to prove it. I, be I strongly believe it's true, because in all concrete examples I've seen ADS, uh, uh, Poincare patch of ADS, BTZ, 
to massive topological black holes which are asymptotical ABS. Uh, this is always true, but in general, I'm not able to prove it, so not even with simple boundary condition. It's definitely because I'm, I'm not skilled enough, but I strongly believe this holds true. Uh, if someone comes up with a good idea, I would be very, very happy to know it. But let's say now that I have a bound, that I know that the first two ingredients that I'm, I want to have are there, propagation of singularities and existence of advanced and retarded fundamental solutions, now uh, I can talk about a quantum field theory. Because now I, I know that the whole classical problem can be codified in the following exact sequence, which is a, basically the translation in this setting of the same exact sequence you have on global hyperbolic space-time, basically telling you about the kernel of G theta, telling you about the image of, G, of P theta, and of, and of the surjectivity of this map. So this is very nice, and this entails that if you construct the algebra of observables, as you would be doing in uh, standard algebraic quantum field theory, everything goes through because to construct the algebra of observables, the only ingredient you need are the equations of motion and advanced or retarded fundamental solution implementing the CCR. As far as the algebra is concerned, you can pick a textbook in, uh, let's say, in AKFT, and then you can read the construction do it for this case, everything goes true. Furthermore, you even have a time slice axiom, which means that there is an isomorphism of algebras because basically uh, when you construct the space of solution and you have, let's say, a compactly supported initial datum lying here, you can take another, any other strip and there is a corresponding datum here which generates the same solution or if you look at the level of algebras, there is an algebra isomorphism between the algebra localized in the whole space-time and an algebra localized in a strip. And that's uh, very important if you want to prove uh, the deformation argument, uh, use the deformation argument as we will be doing later on. So this is to say that under these conditions, quantum field theory at the level of algebra works perfectly fine. Now, of course, we are well aware that the one needs the wavefront set of the advanced and retarded fundamental solutions. Can, do we know it? And the answer also in this case is yes, we know it. We need an operatorial wavefront set here. Of course, it's a more, let's say, it's a more suited to discuss this problem. And as usual, you get exactly the same wavefront set you will be expecting, bearing the fact that here, you have to encode the fact that there is refraction at the boundary, so that when you hit the boundary, the light ray is reflected. And this is encoded in the fact that here, the two points in the your wavefront set are connected by a broken B characteristic. So basically, this point and this point lie, uh, singular, lie on the same, so let's say, on a singular light ray. In a global hyperbolic space time, this would not happen, but here you hit the boundary and you go here, so. That's basically what you have to tell to your propagators. Okay, so we also know the wavefront set. What about then states? What are states? Well, states, it's a long story. Um, you have already heard uh, if you were here on, uh, on Monday, but let's say that for all practical purposes, I'm looking for a bi-distribution, which is on shell, so satisfies the equations of motion with prescribed boundary condition in both entries. It's positive and its anti-symmetric part coincides up to, let's say, this I factor to the advanced minus retarded fundamental solution. So this is. And in addition, I trying to say, well, let's say, what do we want as a Hadamard condition? Minimum, uh, well, let's say the minimal idea is the following. What is the Hadamard condition? The Hadamard condition is nothing but if I uh, look at a point here and I look at the, at the geodesic neighborhood here, which is global hyperbolic, there is no reason whatsoever why I would be expecting my state to have a different singular structure than that of a Hadamard state. It should not know that there is a boundary out there or if I look at the singular structure of my two-point function. But at the same time, it has to know that if this point and this point talk to each other, they are connected by this reflected right ray at the boundary. So the modification is simply this one. 
let's assume that the wavefront we call a state of Hadamard form, if the wavefront set is the same as we have in global hyperbolic space time, bearing the fact that here I allow for reflection at the boundary, which is exactly intuitively what we would be expecting, let's say, after 18 months of studies in the physics department. But so the intuition we get uh, when we're starting uh, our bachelor studies is probably the correct one. And here is reflecting the notion of Hadamard space. Uh, well, okay, good. Everyone can, um, can uh, spell out a definition, but the definition is as good as the properties uh, descending out of them. And, uh, and first and foremost, you need to give examples. So do Hadamard state exist? Well, let's say com consider, oh, and in this slide there is on purpose a mistake. It's really on purpose. There is, so let's consider a global hyperbolic asymptotically ADS. Let's start with static space time, so no explicit time dependence, neither on beta nor on the metric on the Cauchy surfaces. The Klein Gordon equation with uh, zero mass uh, here for simplicity can be written uh, like this. So E is an elliptic operator, which is beta times the Laplacian on K. Assume that uh, theta satisfies so static boundary conditions, so no time dependence. Then you can construct the following two-point function, which is basically constructed out of the spectral calculus of the C. And this is, uh, you can show that the wavefront set is exactly that of a Hadamard two-point function. You do it, you are happy until uh, you have a smart PhD student that insists telling you, I have a divergence in my plot. No, no, it's wrong, your plot. Try again. I have a divergence in my plot. Yeah, and he was right. He was computing the vacuum polarization uh, in certain scenarios, and I, I forgot that I'm, I'm so obsessed about ultraviolet divergences that I never think about infrared divergences. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a bad habit when you're working in quantum field theory and space time. You tend to forget large distances, and uh, you always focus uh, on the short distances. So provided that this is a bi-distribution, so there are no divergences, infrared divergences, then if this is a well-defined by distribution, then you have a Hadamard state. So if this is a by distribution, Tony, can you give me an example where this happened, where you have a, an infrared divergence? Yes, Bertotti Robinson space time, I don't know if you are familiar with it. This is an exact solution of Einstein Maxwell equation, which approximates the near horizon geometry of horizon Nernst from a black hole. And if you try to construct a quantum field theory there and you don't put the Dirichlet boundary condition, you get infrared divergences when constructing the ground state. So it can happen. To conclude, because I, my time is almost over, since I have a Hadamard state now on static space time, provided I don't have infrared divergences, and uh, I have a propagation of singularity theorem, and I know that advanced and retarded fundamental solutions do exist, then can I run a deformation argument to prove that Hadamard state exists also in non-static space-time? And the answer is yes, provided that your boundary condition does not uh, spoil your party, which means that it has to be a static boundary condition. Probably you don't need that, but that was the best I could prove. So if you have a static boundary condition, then you know that Hadamard state do exist by a deformation argument. So the, to conclude, the three ingredients are existence of advanced retarded fundamental solution, propagation of singularities, and condition on Adamant state. I'm not claiming that this is the end of the story or the best answer we can get. That's our proposal, how to deal with these theories. And let me conclude by saying the following, that what I've proven is substantially what I told you before. What do, I, what do we need to do? Of course, this is, I anticipate the question, of course, it would be nice to look at higher spin field, gauge fields, and so on and so forth in this class, so in, the, in these space times. But I want also to answer the question, what about the support properties of G plus minus? I think they should be the usual ones, but I don't know how to prove. And uh, I would like to start, at least uh, with Alessio, we are trying to study interacting models with uh, different boundary conditions, uh, trying to generalize a paper by Inchiso and Cameron where they consider basically uh, lambda phi to the four or cubic for interaction in the equation of motion with the Richelieu boundary conditions. And we want to use this method to study this class of problems. And to conclude the very, very conclusion, this is very, very abstract, 
let me tell you, we have concrete examples of two-point functions, not just they exist, uh, we, they, they exist, they are unique, and we don't know them, but we really know them in many concrete cases. We can write them explicitly in terms of a mode expansion. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.